My friends, what lays before you is the myriad knowledge of an unfathomable universe. Join our intrepid remembrancers as they explore the heresy as history. From deep within the farthest reaches of the great library of Tiska, we are the Heresy Grad School. So said the War Master in his wisdom. Go forth, my sons, and illuminate them. That's what we do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hey guys, this we planned this five minutes before we recorded. Shh, shh, shh. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. But yeah, no, I'm I'm excited for this new intro and everything. Yeah, so. man, it's awesome. And I hope everybody else likes it too. <sighs> if you don't, you can just shut the fuck up. And uh, no, I'm just kidding. Right. I think it'll be cool. No, I I, I think people will like it. I think the direction that the main cast is going and that we're going, I think it's going to be awesome. Yeah. Yeah excited but uh if you guys are ready okay well so so we're talking we're picking up kind of where we left off right last time in the black book yeah yeah yes. and uh and then yeah there's a couple cool places that uh i think we'll get to today but no rush we'll see what happens yeah so uh all right listeners if you've been listening in uh just uh Starting back into our Thousand Suns coverage with uh, Professors Dave, Jason, and myself, Patrick, and, you know, just getting right back into it. I think uh, Jason is leading us off this time. Can I just jump in and say one thing that's just kind of a non sequitur? I mean, absolutely. This I've is never, grad school, after all. I, I've never actually used the word non sequitur, I think, in, in an actual sentence before, so I don't know. I hope I used it right. Um, <laughs> so I was listening to Slaves of Darkness today. Yeah? Yeah, that's a pretty new book, right? I don't know if I can say anything about it. Is that like, do I have to do spoiler uh, alert? I mean, it's been out for a while. Really? Slaves of Darkness? Yeah. Yeah, like six months? Or has it been like over a year? No, I feel like it's been over a year. I okay. feel like it's been long enough. Plus, I mean, you don't give people spoiler alerts for new textbooks, right? No, because you make them buy them. Exactly. We should do that. Oh, it's a fucking great idea. Um, yeah, listeners, tell us if you would ever consider buying a uh, Heresy Grad School textbook. Keep us posted on that. Go ahead. So sorry. anyway, <laughs> so so John French writes... Um, the man, the myth, the legend. He is, he is definitely one of the lords of Terra, right? So he okay. writes Slaves to Darkness, mm. which is, I think, the second to last... Um, of the Horus Heresy books, right? Came out uh, August of last year. That's right. Okay, so it's been almost a year, right? Yeah. And then he also uh, is the first author in the Solar Wars. So, I, and I started the Solar Wars right after I finished Barry Dagger, but I didn't read Slaves to Darkness because I was rushing through Barry Dagger, figuring like, oh, I really need to read this to be where I need. You don't, right? You need to read Slaves to Darkness, and then I feel like you can miss Barry Dagger. I mean, it's probably going to be important later on, but it's not important for the first part, I think, of Solar Wars. Um, it, yeah. I what cried a little bit with Slaves of Darkness, but um, I, I won't ruin it just Yo, because... Dude, I you, almost emailed you like three times today. I know exactly what you're you, talking about. You know about, about a certain yeah. someone who is very close to my... My heart and but this was, that was just also a yeah okay we're going totally off topic here that yeah. was a that was a weird scene but what I wanted to say is what we're talking about tonight right our favorite legion um, no. does have a little cameo at the end which is pretty uh, cool that's right like like weirdly out of nowhere and uh, I just thought that was cool so they come back for the first time I think like. None of the other, this won't be a spoiler, none of the other legions even know these guys fucking still exist, right? So so there's this final scene at the, I won't spoil it, there's this final scene at the end of Slaves to Darkness where sort of like Horus is getting the band back together, right? So all the, the traitor legions are there and this, you know, it's just everybody's there and then all of a sudden, this fucking Magnus and then nine 
thousand sons, just nine. That's it. Like everybody else is like their legions are still like relatively intact, right? I mean, the third legion is like a little fucking motley crew, but, um, but like, that's it. Nine thousand sons, like just disapparate from the warp. And then Magnus comes down and everybody's like, I thought, like, I think the, they, they actually were like ghosts. It was so fucking cool. It made right. me happy. Yeah. Although it's interesting that the third legion are so like ragged considering like post siege of like I'm going into like 40k stuff now but like post siege of terror like mid scouring and post scouring they're actually like one of the strongest legions next to like the word so really yeah like they you know what I'm this is like a 40k spoiler so I don't care I I, I really don't but they like practically destroy the sons of Horus during the Legion Oh, Wars. yeah, you're good. Yeah. I, I see where you're going here. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, destroy yeah, yeah. Lupercalia, steal Horus's body. Yeah. Sorry, spoilers, listeners. <laughs> shit gets weird after the scouring, man. Shit, just shit, shit yeah. gets To be weird. fair, though, the Sons of Horus immediately punch the Third Legion in the nose again. Well, because Abaddon shows up and is like, uh, let's think about this. I mean, it, between that and... And uh, Karn, it pretty much destroys the Third Legion as an actual legion. Oh, Karn had such a fucking good appearance in Slaves of Darkness. Have you read it, Jason? I have. Oh, man, I just that was such a great scene. Fucking Karn walking out of the, like, the shadows. All right. Karn is pretty spectacular. He's kind of the coolest guy in the world. Even in 40K, he's, he's a little nuts in 40K, but he's still, still a pretty awesome character. So. All right. Okay. So that that was my non sequitur. I still don't know if I use that word right. Non sequitur. I think if we're uh, touching on vocabulary, are we just going to let it pass that Dave used a Harry Potter term to describe how Magnus appears from the warp? <laughs> he apparated. <laughs> Is that not a real word? No. I mean, I mean, I think it probably originated thanks to um, J.K. Rowling. J.K. Rowling. Yeah. Yeah. She owns that in Urban Dictionary. I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know. How else would you describe it, Jason? No, I guess that's pretty fair. I just I didn't want to let that pass without comment. <laughs> it's it true. Called, that like, is translocation or something like that. Actually, like it's his version of teleportation. I know. Like he just shows up, but like <sighs> because he doesn't use like a teleportation matrix, he just. Poof. Who are we talking about now, Magnus or Harry Potter? <laughs> Magnus. You know, Fuck, I don't ha- know. Harry Potter's got a <laughs> fucking wand. Magnus has a staff. There are a lot of shards of Magnus. You never know. Yeah. Yeah. It's Turns cool. out he's got a bunch of Horcruxes. Oh, also, good point, dude. Not dissimilar. Yeah. All right. I'm yeah. going to let Jason save us or save me um, from this. All right. Uh, you heard it here. Magnus exploded into Horcruxes. That is the official stance of the Remembrancer's Retreat. Yeah. Yeah. We'll stand by that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, uh, let's get into a little bit of that real Thousand Suns lore here. Uh, tonight, if you're uh, checking out the Black Book alongside us, it's going to be starting out on page 143. Tonight, I'm going to look over a really specific but very important little snippet here. Uh, it's under a heading called The Cursed Legion. This is kind of the beginning of the end. I know that's kind of a cliche term, but it really fits perfectly here for the Thousand Suns. So check it on out on page 143 of your book seven. So we're explaining here. The Thousand Suns are really small. This is something that remains consistent across their lifespan as a legion and even into 40k. They're small but very potent. So, it mentions here, while the strength of the other legions grew by the thousands or even tens of thousands, the 15th grew in more modest numbers, sometimes even shrinking when the war took its inevitable toll. So, this is pretty weird so far as legions go. Um, Legion numbers and legion uh, induction percentages, like the amount of their inductees that survive the implantation and ascension process to a full-born Legionis Astartes is always apparently compared to the first legion. They were kind of used as like the measure and median. Uh, it's getting a little weird for the Thousand Sons, because if you'll remember back to last time and even the time before that, 
uh, when we spoke on the Thousand Suns, they were really unique in the fact that they had an incredibly high uh, acceptance rate for their inductees. Then we also touched on how the Emperor himself kind of had a personal hand in selecting a lot of them, which was probably a pretty big point in their favor. But at this time, half a decade after their exodus from Terra, we're still looking at a little under 10,000. Uh, as far as legions go, that's a little odd because the Luna Wolves, the largest at the time, uh, were about 50,000. Now, all of the legions to this point, which I thought was kind of interesting, uh, I know it's called out time and time again that the World Eaters had a interesting habit of inducting the strongest warriors from whatever planet they conquered uh, to kind of form this, you know, brotherhood without banners, if you want. But um, it was apparently, and this was a little bit of debate, I've heard it, you know, uh, talked about several times, but apparently uh, it says here specifically they still harvested conquered worlds like all legions, uh, but the numbers taken were small. So I did think it was interesting that uh, they specifically call out that every legion kind of harvests new inductees, at least in this early stage of the Great Crusade. Uh, but the Thousand Suns, the numbers that they're harvesting from these conquered worlds are extraordinarily small uh, compared to something like the mass inductions of the Luna Wolves or the word bearers around the Imperial Heralds at the time. So it goes on to say that uh, relatively few survive the ascension to Legionis Astartes, which is kind of a stark contrast to what we talked about earlier. Uh, they had that very high induction and acceptance rate. And I wanted to talk a little bit here. What do you guys think the reasoning behind that could be for such a uh, marked shift there? So, I mean, I mean, like you mentioned before, Jason, like the emperor handpicked almost all of the original Thousand Sons. I mean, and, you know, he engineered Magnus. And I wonder just like because of that, like pure selection, like, of course, those are going to be the best of the best. But also it's the Great Crusade. There's a timetable for how or how many planets that need to be conquered or, or brought back into the fold of the Imperium and you're constantly on the move and they just don't have that option to hand hand pick and select as well as as they could have and so they're forced into that you know i wouldn't necessarily call it a production line but but i guess mass selection of initiates like how all the other legions do and just because their gene seed is is almost so specific that it has this latent psyker effect I wonder if that's the reason why. Yeah, Pat. I, I mean, I think that's exactly the reason why. So I think um, when you talk about compatibility between sort of the gene seed and the, the you know, the humans that are being inducted into the Legion, um, I, I think there's a reason why the Emperor handpicked the, the first thousand sons, right? And I think part of that was sort of both their latent psychic potential, their ability to receive this gene seed that was, was you know, was highly psychic in its, you know, genetic makeup. Um, and uh, I think they also just probably didn't take a lot of losses, right? I mean, their fighting style, uh, the fighting style of the Thousand Suns, right, was not the world eaters, right? These guys were not running with chain axes and bull pistols into the, you know, um, the front lines of the enemy. Uh, they were, they were not seeking that type of arena style, like brutality in combat. They were very reserved and I think very tactical. I mean, uh, there's a couple of really cool, um, battle reports, I guess, sort of the exemplary battles in the, in the, in the black book, um, go into one of them a little bit later, but, it definitely speaks to their timing and discipline and overall sort of, of of strategy on the battlefield. So I think they probably just didn't need a lot of, of inductees. That's my theory anyway. Yeah. And I mean, at least going back to the idea of like the handpick initiates versus like, you know, the mass picking from a, from a world, you also have to look at 
maybe this, you know, calling people stock is is kind of a double-edged sword kind of no-no area, but like the stock of 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 initiates on Terra has the potential to be more, you know, quote unquote pure than say like from from planet Echo three forty seven nineteen or or you know fill in the blank, you know. No, I think you're. I think you're onto something, yeah. right? Because because the the thousand suns were remarkably homogeneous in their in their makeup, right? When they left Terra, I think it was like nine out of ten were selected from the Achaemenid Empire, right? So these people were people. These were legionnaires that shared a culture. They shared a homeland. They shared a tradition, and so. Um, which is not unlike a lot of the other legions, but at, but then they get to their sort of their home world, right? Like so, like the Terrans of the Dusk Raiders before they get to Barbarus, right? They're different than the Barbarian um, Death Guard, right? They just are. So, so I don't want to be too, I guess, um, but I think at this point in the timeline, right? We're still talking about the 15th Legion pre-reunion uh, with Magnus. Um, is that correct, Jason? Uh, yeah, this is only about a half a decade after leaving Terra. Yeah, so I mean, we're early on in the Crusade, and I just think, um, I think probably more than anything, these guys just weren't taking a lot of heavy losses. I mean, their engagements were, what we know of their early engagements were very... Um, not minor, but um, they certainly weren't like, you know, taking on the Ragden, you know, Xeno side, some shit like that. I don't know. Jason, what do you think? Well, one thing, I think the immediate, you know, kind of solution that jumps to mind is that, like you said, it's not quite a production line, especially not for the Thousand Sons, but they are recruiting with comparatively you know, loosened restraints compared to everybody being hand-selected by the emperor. However, in the other direction, I think it's kind of interesting to puzzle it out, and even the emperor's hand-selected initiates are not immune from the problems the Thousand Sons face, because uh, in Thousand Sons, the novel by Graham McNeil, Ahriman specifically says he and her, his brother Ormutst uh, were separated and Ormitz was killed by the flesh change. Now, Ahriman is definitely Terran, so Ormitz obviously is too, so he was in that initial induction, maybe not of the Thousand Sons themselves, I haven't found anything to say specifically he was, but he was definitely Terran. So even the original, like, Terran legionaries aren't immune from some of the issues that crop up. No, I mean, I, I mean, I think you're right. I just, and I think that becomes more important as the um, the crusade goes on, and then we start to see some of the, you know, these the hidden curse of the legion come to play. And that's what I was thinking originally. I was like, wow. I mean, like the reason these guys are not recruiting is because they don't want people to know. Right. Like they don't want to be they don't want people to know that they're suffering from this sort of like um, mutation, genetic degradation. They don't like know what it is yet. Right. They're not I mean, they're, they're pretty sure that it's because of, um, you know, uh, the warp and, and sort of the psychic uh, potential manifestations that they have. And we'll sort of go into the reasons why and behind that. But. But at this point in the crusade, the very early crusade, I would have to say that the reason, um, in my mind, that the legion is not recruiting in large numbers is because they were never a large legion. They never wanted to be a large legion, right? They never wanted to be um, the 13th legion, right? They didn't have 500 worlds to draw from. And they never wanted to be you know, the Luna Wolves. They were happy being a smaller legion, sort of esoteric in its makeup, um, very cultured. You know, that's the tradition of the Achaemenid Empire and sort of, um, yeah, I just think, man, they're just 
kind of fucking elitist, man, you know? <laughs> I would no doubt know how else to say it, but uh, yeah, that's where I'm going. No, that's a pretty good way to say it. All right, so what else do we uh, know yes. about these guys? So that brings us pretty well to kind of the beginning of the end of what really started the Thousand Sons down their path to having to strike some deals they don't want to make. This begins on a crazy little planet called Bizant. So, starting out here, this is elements of the second and fifth chapters. And I thought it was kind of interesting. They refer specifically to chapters instead of uh, companies here. But, uh, anywho, important stuff you need to know here. So, wacky little planet called Bizant. The thing about these people, uh, they are sun-worshipping humans pretty decently normal humans so far as it goes, but they maintain a priesthood uh, who take up residence in these golden temples and who are ritually blinded by the sun. And these, priest, uh, these priests of uh, the Byzantine Empire, haha, <laughs> um, they're chosen from people among this culture who can hear the light of the stars, which is, as near as we can figure, an interesting way to say psychically gifted. Now the important part here is that it calls out specifically that one in ten of this population are similarly blessed in this way of being able to hear the starlight, which is crazy considering um, in Warhammer 40k and several of the rule books, um, the one I'm thinking of specifically, uh, I think it's the 6th edition rule book, calls out psychers manifesting on Terra is about one in a million of the populace because they're talking about uh, psychic nulls and blanks are about one in a million psychers. And compare one in a million manifesting a measurable, quote-unquote, worthwhile psychic talent on Terra. On this planet, one in ten are manifesting psychic potential, which is insanity, comparatively. So this battle uh, is really special for the Thousand Suns because these are uh, they're attacked with arts uh, of the warp, described as uh, when they make planet fall, it's said they're met with fire, nightmare, and the roar of dissolving matter. And this is really special for them, because in the same way that the world eaters, or uh, the warhounds at the time, would be fulfilling their purpose, like the reason they were created, by hurling themselves into a really martially gifted, like, warrior culture, the Thousand Suns, for the first time, are meeting a race that's so psychically gifted that it gives them pause. And... This is something that's so completely unique and special for them that they hurl themselves into it with every, you know, bit of ambition they have to give. And fighting back using their own manifested powers, pretty much the dominant majority of the Legion is psychically, you know, um, has emerged psychically now. And uh, it does mention that they are wildly differing, um, amounts of talent to those psychic manifestations, which I think might be part of the side effect of their recruitment process still, is they're getting a wider range of recruits, which are interacting in a wider and more varied way with the gene seed, which is showing itself um, phenotypically as expressing a wider range in psychic talent. And even the ones that don't, uh, you know, obviously... Um, express psychic talent, you still have the majority of the rest at least, you know, psychically evident. So, the Byzanti are perfect for the Thousand Sons to really kind of flex the power that they have been honing, that they've had unique to themselves this entire time. And it's really described uh, pretty terrifically as, uh, it says there are no accounts outside those of the Thousand Sons of the battle, but 
if they can be believed, it was as though the fundamental elements of existence itself warred that day. Clouds spun of lightning cleaved through hurricanes of debris, and the shrieks of invisible battles soared through the burning air. The Legion had never been so tested. Its warriors poured every scrap of skill and strength into the battle, but still could not break the Byzantine priests. Then, as the psychic deadlock forced black rain from the sky, the pressure broke and a single scream echoed through every mind on the planet. So, the psychic scream is from the first of the Thousand Suns to ever succumb to what's called the Flesh Change. Uh, it's recorded in the Thousand Suns Book of History. It's called the Book of Days and Passing, recovered from uh, the libraries on Prospero. Uh, his real name isn't recorded. He's referred to as Daleth, and he's re uh, represented in the book of Days and Passing by a single sigil and a dead tongue. And a lot of savants and uh, linguistic scholars in the 30K universe have debated it, but Daleth has a lot of meaning to it. It could be purely esoteric. Uh, they said it could symbolize a door from the past into the future, or the beginning and end of all things. And at the height of this battle, let me read the description to you here, uh, the warrior's body slowly blew apart. Thick flows of malleable flesh spilled from his broken armor, bone fused with the substance of his war gear, and his blood misted and congealed into new forms in the air, as all the while the nameless warrior screamed for mercy in a thousand silent voices heard in every mind of his legion. This is something that honestly terrifies the Thousand Sons. They've never seen this before. They've never dealt with it before. And his brothers turn on him and kill him. Uh, they destroy him with bolter fire and bathe his remains in cleansing psychic flame until he was nothing but the dust of ashes. And every one of them there swear to keep the fate of their brother from all outside the Legion. Even now, well, now being in uh, the time that the historian of the Horus Heresy is recording these things, the only accounts they have of that event exist of because of what comes after in the Thousand Suns history. Uh, just because by the time the flesh change starts happening rampantly, there's no hope of keeping that a secret anymore just inside the Legion. Uh, kind of in the same way the Curse of the Wolfen can only be held together inside the route for so long before it gets out. Hey, Jason, can I just, just jump in really quickly here? Because Absolutely. It, this is so important, I think, in the history of the Thousand Suns, right? So we don't have a lot more about Byzant and what happened there, but if you, if you have book seven and you can like flip to page 144, 145, we do have a pretty cool... Um, it's not like a full color plate, but it's sort of like what Forge World does with their um, dynamic pictures, right? And so I, this is clearly Byzant, and this is clearly what's going on. And it's, you know, as as you're reading it, and I think as Jason's talking about it, it just weirdly foreshadows um, what's to come on Prospero, right? I mean, this is this is the moment where I think there's some boundary that's crossed. There's some invisible line that's crossed. And I think this is the moment where the pact with demons is made, right? This is the moment where the Legion really becomes exposed to um, the warp, right? I mean, this is, this is Zeech you know, reaching into them. This is the first spawn. This is the first mutation. Um, and I, so I don't know. I mean, I just got to like, you know, this sort of chills up my back just thinking about this, but I think it's weirdly similar to the last battle on Prospero. And uh, they call it the impossible battle later in the book. But uh, yeah, I think, and then you, you, you look at what Daleth means, right? Um, it's the beginning, you know, and the end of all things. So it's, this is it, man. This is it. This is what happened. Um, and it's also just a really cool picture because we get the pre Prospero thousand sons in their, um, you know, their original Terran 
uh, livery, which I think is the only picture we really have of them, and it's just fucking awesome, man. I hope Dave finally does get to do this army because I really want to see it on the table. But um, but yeah, that's no, it. Byzant, man, I think it's pretty critical to the to the early lore of uh, of the Thousand Sons. I am a little curious. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about in just a second here as the significant with uh, significance in real world religions to Araman and Ormuzd, but curiously, uh, Daleth is apparently the fourth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And I'm kind of curious if that has any significance to how they're using it here. But uh, while we're on it, I know a lot of folks, um, it's kind of been you know, figured out for years now, uh, Araman is a uh, Persian name, which kind of gives a little bit of a hint to, you know, his origins on Terra. But what's really interesting that I don't know if, uh, I certainly haven't heard it widely discussed before, uh, Araman and Ormitzt are actually two sides of the same sort of uh, rivalry in uh, Zoroastrianism. And what's neat is, and I apologize in advance, uh, anybody who studied the you know, early theology of Iran could probably describe it in much better terms than I can. But a very oversimplified version, uh, Araman is actually the Persian equivalent of um, Angramanyu, who is in uh, Zoroastrianism the adversary to Ahura Mazda, uh, their uh, god and creator. And what's interesting though, the alternative name of Ahura Mazda is Ormuzd. So they flatly pulled, not really like a, um, it's not accurate to call it like a god and the devil, sort of uh, adversarial relationship, but definitely opposed. So I thought that was kind of cool. Jason, I'm, I'm like going back to my early um, sort of world religions studies, and I, I do remember like Zoroastrianism is the, uh, it's, it's the, it's the precursor to like all the monotheistic religions, right? Like e even sort of Judeo-Christian religions, right? This is what I think most religious scholars would say sort of is the architecture for the modern monotheism that we have. I don't know if that was something that you you were aware of, or you were just going for the uh, the literature there. Uh, it is uh, something that I uh, remember, maybe way back from undergrad, but I absolutely trust you when you say it. So, so I think I think those sort of diametrically opposed forces there, I think, are are cert super accurate, man. I think that's really interesting. Um, and I really love that comparison. Right? So, because I, I mean, I still think Armand's the good guy. I know Pat's going to correct me on this at some point. He's going to be like, "No, the 40k novel." You'll, oh, you'll... he's an asshole in 40k. All right, so 100 I mean, percent an asshole in 40k. <laughs> he's all right in 30k. Still I mean, an asshole. Savitar refers to him as a what was it? A pretentious Terran shithead. I love it's it. It's a pretty accurate description. Seems. I thought so. Seems reasonable. Yeah. Um, but you know, so I haven't haven't like uh, gone down the rabbit hole on on, on Armin and forty k. So so don't like hate me for that. But um, but yeah. So I think what we're 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 seeing here is sort of you know the the diametrics of what you know Armin represents and maybe what Ormus represents. But um, but yeah, very cool. That's what we do here. Crazy rabbit holes. Um. Jason, is there anything, did you want to go deeper down this rabbit hole on Byzant? Uh, I was going to turn it over to you for the couple of readings uh, you're excited to talk about tonight. Okay, there's just really a quick one on Byzant, um, and then I'll, I'll sort of like go back to you guys and see what you think. But, um, and this really gets into sort of, I think when the the Legion becomes like cloistered, right? They become sort of clandestine and and removed from the rest of of the imperium on um, the crusade so this is on page 11 book 7 it's a call out box called the byzantian oath 
Among the many secrets kept by the Thousand Sons that would be revealed in the wake of the destruction of Prospero was that of the occurrence on the distant world of Byzant in 823.m30. It was here that the first of the 15th legion succumbed to the terrible cost of the powers employed by such abandon during the earliest years of the Thousand Sons' Great Crusade campaigns. His very flesh corrupted by the effects of the legion's psychic manifestations and turned against him. Rather than reveal this damning tragedy to the leaders of the Great Crusade and risk censure and even perhaps purgation, the captains of the 15th Legion instead chose to hide the event from sight. The conclave of captains who controlled the Thousand Sons in the years before the coming of Magnus called upon the Legion to swear what became known as the Byzantine Oath, to lie to the lords of Terra and the emperor himself, that the legion might confront this mishap of warped flesh without outside aid or judgment, perhaps deeming no other capable of such a task, or simply resenting that others might stand above them. Such was the hubris and the resulting brooding isolation that it created. It consumed the legion in the days of glory. For just as the distance held by the other legion protected them from the taint of the 15th becoming known, it also left them unable to influence or aid their faltering brothers and condemned them to the doom that later overtook the legion. So, I mean, I think there's a lot in there to sort of unpack, but this is sort of really the, the beginning of how the legion becomes so um isolated right like they're just so they're distrusted and they're distrusted because of this secret that they um of the flesh change and i think it just it sort of becomes their 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 achilles heel it becomes their nemesis right they just they they've got to find a way to combat it and fight it but they don't trust anyone else to help and um, I think really this this leads to the allegations of of sorcery and um, you know dabbling in the warp and, and and going too far and everything else that eventually sees them condemned right at, at the um, the Council of Nikea. But I just thought it was interesting because we start to see terms like cabal, right? Like we start to see this council of 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 captains, and it's this very um, hierarchical, you know, organization that uh, I think in the later days of the of the Thousand Sons we would all recognize. You know, these are the the super gifted and powerful psychers. But um, go ahead. what do you guys think of that? I mean, just going to the the Cabal stuff. At, at least from like a early Crusade, mid Crusade, pre like full on heresy and nikea and you know the route coming to prospero i I don't think they were malicious like how um how the word bearers were were starting warrior lodges throughout the different um legions this was definitely more of like i guess a knowledge of network would or a network of knowledge excuse me would probably be the best way to describe it because i mean Obviously, pre-Magnus, they didn't realize this, but once they found Magnus, he wanted them to be as much scholars as warriors, you know, where, you know, Gilliman wanted his his uh, his Marines to be diplomats as well as as well as soldiers. Actually, a thought just kind of occurs to me. So, Dave, you said specifically that they were going to keep this secret from everyone outside the Legion, including the Emperor himself. Do you think that's from a little bit of maybe anger and frustration? Because what would immediately occur to me, like, if I was the Thousand Sun and coming at this completely neutrally, it would be if a you know, a brother of mine exploded into a horrible flesh demon, I'd be like, oh god, what's happening? Like, who do we talk to? My first thought would be the Emperor. But 
we touched a little last time on how there's kind of that weird dichotomy of the Thousand Suns in their purpose while they are, you know, created specifically to deal uh, with Warpcraft and to even use it as a weapon, they're also, you know, bound to spread the Imperial truth in that there is nothing out there besides science. So I think it's kind of interesting that they're swearing this pact to keep this secret from everyone, including the Emperor. And I think that may be because their initial thought is, well, he's not going to help us. No, I mean, that's that's a really good point, man. And I think there's there's some the inferences that we can draw from, from the literature, right? And so I think in the Black Book it says that by this point the Legion has already sort of... Um, surpassed even the most powerful psyker on Terra, right? This The most powerful sanctioned psyker. So a psyker that would be part of the Astro Telepathica or the uh, Scholastica Telepathica, right? So, so they already sort of knew that they were um, special, right? That they were, they were, they were more powerful and more attuned than um, even their brother, legionaries right in the space wolves or the or not you know the velka fenrika or like even like the white scars right other other legions that had similar potential right um and then the other thing i think that's important to remember here is that th these they have not been reunited with their primarch and so the emperor is is like um I mean, that's like really far removed, right? I mean, for, for most legionnaires, I think their Primarch is like, you know, sort of their father, right? So it's like, you know, would you tell dad that like, hey, your brother, you know, did something he wasn't supposed to and his like head had fucking exploded, right? Like, hey man, you know, bro, bro did some stuff he wasn't supposed to. And like, we're kind of worried about it. Um, like, yeah, maybe you might, you might tell your dad that, you know, like if you weren't, you know, but would you tell like, would you tell like your dad's boss that like, I'd have probably not, you know, like that's probably not what you would do. And so, uh, I think, I think there is, there's some, there's some like, um, there's definitely shame, uh, that this happened. And there, I think there's also some like concern that, man, we don't really know what this means, you know, and we get, we got to find out, we got to find out, we got to make this right before we go and like, okay, so this is what happened, and now we can explain it. Because that's what the Thousand Suns are all about, right? They're like about knowledge and sort of the the ability for sort of, for, for knowledge to sort of explain everything. And um, so I think that's kind of what's behind this. But uh, but yeah, no, I mean, just, just, it's, really, it's really cool to see, I think, how a legion that we didn't know a lot about before... You know, they, right? I mean, they are certainly powerful in, in the 40K universe, but there are just very few of them. And so to go back to their earliest beginnings, and it's like a, um, you know, like a, like a paleontologist, man, just like brush away the dust from the ashes. I mean, this is, this is fucking awesome. Uh, but okay, so one other thing before you guys want to get on get in on this at all before I do one other thing here, I just want to give our listeners some context. Yeah, take it away, man. Okay, all right. So um, we're, we're talking a lot about the early Great Crusade, like the early heresy. We're saying sort of these in loose terms, but I want to give you guys like some hard facts, some context. So um, I'm going to go back and I'm going to refer to a couple different sources here. Book eight, uh, for the first time that I've seen, um, and, and there are probably some people out there that will correct me on this, but book eight, page 12, says that 798.m30 was the first action of the Great Crusade. So 798. That was the pacification of Luna, which the 16th Legion, that would make sense, right? The, the, um, the, Sons of Horus, right? The Luna Wolves. The 16th Legion encounters uh, evidence of occultism among the Selenar gene rites. And um, that was sequestered into the Imperial Dungeon. So 
So that's the first in instance of the Great Crusade. So then we can infer from that that like a decade after that, um, you know, we're into the 800s, but the early 800s. And then so, you know, we're probably looking at like 828 um, when this happens. And so that makes sense because we're within, you know, 20 years here at Byzant at 823.m30. So I just thought that was really cool that it all sort of syncs together. Um, the guys at the guys at Forge World, the guys at the Black Library sort of, um, they have this mapped out. And uh, I mean, they always yeah. have to tie it up neatly with a bow, right? I mean, this is really neatly though, Pat. This is like, um, like within a few years. And I think that's really, but yeah, um, Okay. Uh, do, do we want to leave it there for tonight, Pat, or did we want to uh, keep I going? You know, maybe leave it there for tonight, and and we'll uh, we'll get back to it next uh, next week. You know. Yeah, man. Yeah. I'm always willing to get back into it with the uh, with the thousand suns. Yeah, dude. Well, um, I guess uh, Dave, do you have anything to plug or anybody to plug? I don't really have anything or any oh. Pat, you probably do. The guy who did our intro, right? I mean, I guess. <laughs> Wait, when this when this episode goes live, will it have the new intro in it? Damn straight, it'll have the new intro Fuck. in it. Oh man, that's so exciting. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna butcher his name, but if if you ever are looking for like some amazing uh, voice work especially like very much warhammer black library like this guy should be hired by black library to read some books um look up uh let's see the voice of kazath on um fiverr that's f-i-v-e-e-r-r.com um guy by the name of nathaniel he did the uh the new intro for the main cast and he just did ours and it's absolutely phenomenal um yeah no it, yeah. it definitely feels like um listening to like gareth armstrong or um who's the other guy it's right there on the tip yeah of the tongue. yeah um like yeah i can't even describe how jonathan keeble that's the other yeah. guy gareth armstrong and jonathan keeble so yeah this guy i think is like man i could fall asleep listening to him read the black library too that sounds creepy but it's true and uh it, yeah just awesome yeah it's like um he he completely knocked it out of the park and I, he just did a fantastic job so hey listeners hope you all enjoyed that intro you know so uh other than that jason had to hop off early so i will go ahead and plug uh <laughs> coke, coke coke zero coke zero diet coke coke zero Hey, uh, Coca-Cola Company, please be a sponsor. Um, we would greatly enjoy the sponsorship. What I'm really say. excited to um, keep talking about this. I think it's going to be where we're going next is, um, at least what I want to talk about next, is really exciting because it ties in a night house that you guys have never heard about, I promise um bum, bum, bum. yeah and one of our favorite thousand sun characters um who we've given a lot of airtime to um and so i think it's uh it's a story of i think how power unchecked um can be you know uh damning as well as uh you know, enlightening. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's good, man. I think the more I read this, and I think part of the reason we do these, Pat, at least part of the reason I do these, man, it's, I would never get into the depth of like what's in these black books. I would never be able to unpack all these on my own. Like what is in these black books is such deep lore. And really, I think, um, I mean, it's just it's barely just even exploring. three people. <laughs> and barely even the three of us can get through get through yeah. all this lore because you know it, black library does you know 
bring everything together with a bow, but like it's brought together in a bow through like six separate books. It's not just in one black book. Like oh, it'll yeah. show up. Shoot, you found stuff in the, in the the most recent black book. You know, if we start the ca- the cast or this this season, I guess if you want to call it that, of Thousand Suns talking about it. Um, it's just all over the place, and like just the amount of research and like you know we have to just get get down and dirty and find everything. Yeah, no, I think, and I and one of the things I really want to do at some point is like a like a listener call in show, you know, where where people oh, yeah. just send us their send us their comments and feedback from our from our episode. I, like I want to hear that shit, man. Like if you guys if you guys write a well thought out. You know, it doesn't even have to be an email, like a Facebook message and post it. Like, I I mean, I will read that uh, if it pertains to sort of what we've been talking about. If it's thoughtful and explorative and well-referenced, like, and the bar doesn't have to be that high. I'm just saying that to do. But like, just, yeah, I mean, just, I want to hear what you guys think. And I think that'd be super. Yeah. No. And I mean, that just harkens back to like, guys leave us a comment if you're liking where we're heading if you know if you don't yeah. tell us what we need to fix if you don't like uh if you feel like we messed up something about the thousand suns in this episode you know call us out and say hey actually it's in this book because we're a community we want to know or we want you to know what we know and we love to hear from you, you know? definitely but uh i think that's it for tonight so uh for jason's sake i'll say it dave yeah. Um, so, uh, fuck off, Craig. Have a good night, guys. <laughs>